Okay, let's talk about joy this morning. Joy is a serious problem, or the lack of it. So we learned multiple times already that in Yiddishkeit, it's very important to serve Hashem with Simcha. The Shechina, the Divine Presence, cannot rest only mitech Simcha, only when there's joy. And one cannot serve Hashem fully and appropriately and effectively if they're not going to be in a state of joy. But there are issues. People have issues. Life has issues. So what do you do when you're frozen? What do you do when you're emotionally drained, when you're not responding to the normative, typical stimuli, which we call spiritual EDD? What do you do? So today we gave you a whole comprehensive strategy of how to beat down the Sahara, smash the walls of indifference, and that will allow the light of the Neshama to reveal itself and to come forth. Okay. But troubleshooting... You know, along these lines, we, we come with a little problem. So one second, okay, this is going to smash those, that in, enamel of indifference. This is going to allow the neshama to start to function again because sometimes when a person is like wrapped up in delusion, they're not able to respond. Okay, so you're going to be able to get past that, but the result, the aftermath is going to be sadness because you used a lot of strong language and a lot of very, very intense bludgeoning of the animal soul which ultimately <coughs> the person. The person will be sad. That's not good. So we have a problem. Like I shared with you in the last class, sometimes in medicine, when doctors give one medication, it could contradict a, another medication or, or, you know, a very simple and lame metaphor which even lay people understand is when there's like a bl- blood pressure issue, so they give blood thinner. Instead, it could cause hemorrhaging now because now the blood becomes too thin or it doesn't coagulate. I mean, these are issues. So you have to kind of, you can't look at only one detail. There has to be a comprehensive solution. We have to keep everything in mind. The same is true in virtually every kind of problem solving issue. It's almost never one isolated issue. And if you focus only on the isolated reality, you don't take the big picture into consideration. You don't look at the big comprehensive <coughs> situation. You're not going to be able to solve things. And the side effect here, if you will, is the idea of sadness. So, just like a little word on side effects that doctors don't like to agree with or talk about. They say the medication will work, but it has a side effect. So, it's, it's a matter of fact that the, the term side effect, that's, that's an arbitrary term. That's, we choose to look at it as a side effect. I say to the doc, back to the doctor, the medicine has effects. Some of them are desirable, some of them are not. For your purposes, it's better to say, oh, that's a side effect. What makes that any more of a side than the primary effect? What makes one pri- For our, we choose to look at it. This is what we want to accomplish, so that's the primary effect. We don't want the weakness to be engendered, so we call that a side or secondary. But in truth, pharmacology is a dangerous thing. Drugs are powerful, and they tinker with the human body. They play around with, with, with who we are, whether it's our... our, our the, the brain chemicals, or whether it's the other balances, is a very delicate balance in everything in the body. So it has effects. So you, you, could, you could say that this, this um, contemplation has a negative side effect. Really and truly, it's an effect. It effectively dismantles the Sahara, the arrogance of the animal soul, of the, of, the, of the evil side that a person has. It effectively does away with that. But, but it also effectively kills everything else. So what do you do? So Dal Rebbe explained to us why this sadness isn't really that problematic after all and how it can be used in a positive fashion and how sometimes the only way to fight fire is with fire and the only way to deal with real negativity is through negativity. And he explained to us why it's not only a side effect or there's no other choice. This actually is the effective way to deal with the animal soul. We didn't, we didn't really, okay, so we, we explained how this sadness, which generally is not a good thing at all, It's not really sadness, it's bitterness. Bitterness is not sadness. Frustration is not depression. Depression makes a person stay in bed and do nothing. Frustration forces us to get up and face reality and try to make a difference. But what about the joy? And that brings us to today's class. Al Rebbe now continues, and after that frustration, and he said, in general, the time to utilize this negativity is when you're in a bad mood anyway. This is human nature. We have good moods and bad moods. We go up and we go down. It's just the way it is. So when you're anyway in that state, utilize it. You know, you have to, you have to, you have to take advantage of the situation. And, and an advantageous take 
on a situation where you're down to begin with is turn that around, sublimate it, redirect it so it becomes an effective way to fight with the Yetzirah. We talked about this notion that, that the, in, in truth, sometimes the Yetzirah needs to be yelled at and screamed at. The godly soul should actually be angry and should furiously attack the negative, the negative soul. Yeah, we talked about that yesterday. Also, there's like little Pharaoh inside us and you have to deal with the little Pharaohs and the Pharaoh needs to be screamed at because Pharaoh doesn't speak any other language. And then you can use positivity. But the joy, you have to have the joy. Says the Altareb as we continue chapter 31, After all of this, and specifically after all this, a person will be able to come to experience real joy, a higher level of joy, a level of happiness that will saturate the person's existence. And the only way to come to this is now to th- contemplate the following, the Hainu, that is to say, Shazais Yashiv El here is what he must take to heart. To comfort himself. We have these words, and these words are true, and these words ring with a sense of integrity. They really are problems, and they really we are far from Hashem, and we aren't functioning up to par, and it isn't good. It's true, it's all true. However, although the recognition of this could bring somebody to a state of sadness, not recognizing this is simply being delusional. The ostrich is not the national bird of the Jewish people. Putting your head in the sand and ignoring situations solves nothing. However, the comforting thought is that a person must say proverbially to his heart. It's a figurative figure of speech, of course. You don't speak to your heart, but you have to take to heart. You have to relate to this. Indeed, it is so without any shadow of a doubt. Sha'ani, that you want to talk about the I. The I, the ego, me feeling myself independent from God, and so on and so forth. I'm very distant from God. Very, very distant. I'm uh, abominable, disgusting. It's, it's, it's just embarrassing. It's, it's so low how a person could be so obsessed with himself and so focused on nothing but, but his own self-aggrandizement and his own self-advancement and ignoring the reality of the Neshama and not even caring about it. it it's, it's, it's embarrassing. It's, it's so low. But, but if that's all true. That's just the I. That's just the material me. However, that's the body with the animal soul in it. So the material me is a source of shame. It's just, it's ugly. However, that's not all me is about. There's another side of me. The material me is actually powered and animated by a spiritual me. And the spiritual me is, which this is found by everybody. You may be what we call the lightweight of lightweights. The kal shebekalem. You take your Yiddishkeit and your spirituality in a way which is totally superfluous. It's not something that is a, of any interest to you. You don't focus on it. Some people say, I'm a spiritual person. I resonate with spirituality. Person says, I don't resonate with any of this. I'm interested in carnal pleasure. I'm interested in fun. I'm interested in fame and fortune. I have no interest in spirituality. You talk to me spirituality, you put me to sleep in five minutes. Yeah, that might be. But you should know that even that Kal Shabbat even that flimsiest of, 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 of spirits, it has, he nefesh or kiss him, nitzitz mamash. He has a godly soul. And that godly soul that he has, has a spark of God, literally, hamalubish balach yesa, which enables him to exist. If he didn't have that spark of God, he wouldn't be. So it doesn't matter who you are. It doesn't matter how far from Hashem you are. It doesn't matter, matter how abominable your behavior is. At the end of the day, inside of you is actually a piece of God. So this is the comforting thought. I, ugly, bad, far from God, inappropriate, enough to bring me down and make me sad. But that's not all there is to the picture. There's another part of I. And that part of I is glorious, magnificent, and beautiful. It's a piece of God. It's such a powerful and profound piece of God that it literally can become the focus of a person so that instead of feeling down about the material side of me, a person can feel good about the spiritual side of me. 
which is much less me and mo much more spirit, right? Because material me works very well. That's about me. And then the spirit seems a little far to me, but it's still me. In fact, that's what en enables me. I wouldn't be otherwise. And here the Alta Rebbe is going to break this into three different levels. First, he's going to describe the situation of how the godly soul has to inhabit a bodily or material corporeal reality and how that's a deep sense of exile, much like the concept of Mitzrayim, much like the notion of Egypt, and that's why we have to go out of Mitzrayim constantly. Going out of Mitzrayim is not a geography. It's not just history. It's something we have to constantly speak of and remember every morning and every evening, our whole lives long. Because going out of Mitzrayim is what life is really about. It's all about getting out, so to speak, of Galut. And the second thing the Alta Rebbe is going to talk about is, so how do I do this? What's the methodology? How do I get out of Mitzrayim? But how do I become holy? He says, very simple. It's called Torah and Mitzvahs. It's a very, very old system. It's the oldest system. It's God's system. Just get on the train. Do the good things. And finally, he will speak about the fact that a person can find joy in the notion that he is able to leave the material reality behind and experience a sense of spiritual weightlessness, a sense, a, a redemptive sense of joy. So now we're going to go through these three levels. So if I have such a gorgeous, beautiful, magnificent soul, how come it's not really functioning? How come I don't feel it? How come all I'm interested in is the next plate of food or the next What's happening here is that I have an amazing godly soul. And the answer is It's golos. In a deep, deep exile. And exiles disable. Exiles disallow people from functioning. Imagine Napoleon sent off to his little island over there where he would yell at the birds and at the ducks. And nobody listened to him. And in his own mind, he was still... A so this is a, a deep sense of gullus where there's a beautiful neshama, but the neshama is in a very, very dark reality that surrounds it. And therefore... If so, Adaraba. If I really am a magnificent soul, but I'm finding myself in Golos, that shouldn't bring you down. On the contrary. The more I focus on or think about the fact that I'm so far from God, so distant, think about the really abominable and disgusting nature of the way people live their lives. But Hariya Nefesh Olikis should be Begolos Godly Yeser. If, if a person thinks about all the ugliness of, of his existence, so what does that mean? It doesn't mean that I'm worse. It means the gullus is worse. The gullus, the exile, this is all about the exile. So the nefesh is in a terrible gullus. And if the nefesh is in a terrible, if the nefesh is in a terrible gullus, so then what's the natural feeling that becomes engendered in everybody's heart? If you look at somebody who really isn't very capable. They're really not capable. They're not capable. And this person who's totally not capable isn't functioning. They're not functioning. So, so what do you feel for them? Whatever, they're not really capable anyway. That's, that's, what, that's what they're able to do. What if you see a person who had enormous potential, amazing potential, and then they fell into a situation where their life fell apart, but they really had a lot of potential? What do you feel? What's the natural... huh? Empathy, Empathy. Sad. sad pity, Rachmanus. You feel Rachmanus, you feel a sense of such pity. So he says, we have to focus on the fact that the Shem is magnificent and glorious and gorgeous and beautiful and has unbelievable potential. And precisely because the Shem has that potential, and precisely because the Golos is so deep and so profound, what does that awaken with? <laughs> the Golos awakens within me a sense of Rachmanus. A sense of pity, compassion. And this, Therefore, what should I focus on? If it's such a Rachmanus, you see a person that, it's such a Rachmanus on this person. Huh? You want to help them. You want to help them, exactly. If a person, you have no Rachmanus on a person, you don't want to help them. But when you have Rachmanus, the more Rachmanus you have, the more you want to make a difference. Because you feel so bad. So if you look at the situation, you size up the situation, and you see, you understand the potential that was here, and you think about how distant this individual, and you think how distant this individual is from the potential they're able to achieve. Therefore, a person says all of his energy will be focused on. I got to get this person out of the situation. 
It's so sad. It's such a pity they're in this situation. Hashiv el beis avia. I got to get her home. Get her, get this and show home. I got to get her home to her parents' house. Can Let me take her out of extricate her from this terrible situation and bring this poor girl home. Before this was in a before it was stuck in a body. At a time when it was literally enveloped in holiness, this girl deserves to go home. So you meet this, this, you meet this kid, you meet this girl, she's in a terrible situation, you know where she comes from, you decide, come what may, I'm getting her home. And that's how we should look at a situation which is so dark and so ugly and so bad. It shouldn't bring us down. It should motivate us. It should motivate us to have Rachmanus. And if we'll have Rachmanus, we'll do everything we can to help her come home. So I know we're like, huh? In this situation? The fact that we're in the situation shouldn't bring us down. It should inspire us to go home. I know we didn't get to the joy fully, but yeah. kind of interrupted today. So this is like a... Hi. <laughs> We're going to break for now, but with God's help, we shall continue.